Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang, Professor Dr. Fatur Rohman. The Honorable Vice Rectors, Head of Institute, Head of Postgraduate Program, and Deans in Universitas Negeri Semarang. The Honorable Dean, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Dr. Sugianto, and also Vice Deans. The Honorable Committee Chairperson, Professor Dr. Diahrini Indrianti. The Honorable Invited Speakers, Assistant Professor Dr. Aditya P. Adiraja. Assistant Professor Dr. Changlorat Dengnam. Associate Professor Dr. Stefan Bresson. Associate Professor Dr. Roswanira Abdul Wahab. And Professor Dr. Amin Rabnoningsi distinguished guests and all participants. Welcome to the seventh International Conference on Mathematics, Science and Education. On behalf of the organizer, we wish you to extend our warm welcome to the seventh conference organized by Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences. And our speakers today will share the theme of accelerating innovative research from laboratory to industry. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all stand up and sing the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. Ladies and gentlemen, please all rise. Return to your seat. Next is praying. Ladies and gentlemen, let us have a silent moment to pray for the success of the conference. Pray begins. Thank you. Before starting the presentation session, we would like to hear the welcome speech from the comedy chairperson. To begin with, I would like to invite the chairperson of the comedy, Professor Dr. Diahrini Indrianti. Ma'am, time is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all at the opening ceremony of the 7 ICMSE, International Conference of Mathematics, Science, and Education. ICMSE has become one of the greatest annual events of Mathematics and Natural Sciences Faculty of Universitas Negeri Semarang. 
it can be seen from its improving participants and presenters year by the year. The seven ICMSE has successfully invited leading scholars, researchers, and lecturers to present varied topic with its main theme, accelerating innovative research from library to industry. The objective of the seven ICMSE is to exchange and share idea as well as, well as research finding from all presenters. Also, it provides the interdisciplinary forum for those involved to present and discuss the most recent innovation, trend, concern, practical challenge, encounter, and the solution adopted in the field of mathematics science and education. As the chairperson of the conference, I would like to express Congratulations and appreciation to all keynote speakers, what Doc, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman N. Hu, Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang, Assistant Professor Chalongrat from Prince Songlah University, Thailand, Associate Professor Stephen Brishen from National University of Singapore, Assistant Prof. Aditya P. Adireja, PhD, from University of Arizona, USA, Associate Professor Roswanira from University Technology Malaysia, and Professor Dr. Amin Ratnoningsi from Universitas Negeri Semarang. And also to the organizing committee who have been working hard to prepare this conference. Then it is my honor to say welcome 313 presenters and 18 participants coming from many universities in Indonesia and some from other countries, Iran, Russia, Thailand, and China. This year's conference moved to the conference to virtual platform in order to protect everyone's safety and health due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This critical adjustment is to made to respond to the pandemic and to the ensure that the knowledge exchange is still happening despite the working or studying at home policy. I wish the conference to be successful and reach its goal as mentioned and I wish all the presenters and participants enjoy the virtual conference. Thank you very much indeed. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, ma'am, for the speech. Next, we are honored to invite our keynote speaker today, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman, who will also officially open this conference and deliver the keynote speech. Before we have him on the presentation, I'd like to, he to read his curriculum vitae. Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman is rector and professor in Universitas Negeri Semarang. He was born in Banyumas and finished his study in Ike Bandung for undergraduate degree, Universitas Indonesia for master degree, and Universitas Gajah Mada for doctoral degree. He received some awards for the best student, lecturer, and best figure of Bahasa Indonesia user. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman, Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Selamat pagi, semangat pagi. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing and mercy that we could gather in this international conference through online. The honorable distinguished plenary speakers, assistant professor Dr. Chalongrat Dengam from Thailand, Assessor Professor Stephen Bresan, Singapore, 
Associate Professor Aditya P. Adireja PhD from USA, Associate Professor J.M. Dr. Roswanira from Malaysia, Professor Dr. Insinyur Amin Rutoningsi, MSE from UNES. And all distinguished guests, presenter and participant from Iran, Russia, Thailand, China, and Indonesia. On behalf of Rektor Universitas Semarang, or UNES, allow me, Rektor UNES, would like to say thank you very much to all speakers that you will present insightful ideas according to your field of expertise in this interna international conference. I believe that your presentation will improve knowledge and experience of all participants and provide significant scientific contribution. I also extend my sincere gratitude to the Dean of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Science, UNES, and the, the committee for their untiring efforts to organize this international conference. And today, with these remarks, I declare the seventh international conference on mathematics, science, and education officially open. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before I share the ideas, I would like to introduce the vision next of UNES is to be a conservation oriented university. Next, next. Ah. With international reputation, we continuously build and develop collaboration with foreign institutions to improve human resources and bring out goodness to the world. UNES, as a house of science, we also do the very best to produce quality human resources in various fields in order to make better life. As a conservation university, I would like to bring you to our conservation efforts. We divided our conservation efforts into three pillars, environments, characters, and culture. We implement eight values of characters, conservation, inspiration, humanity, compassion, innovation, creativity, sport, tifoli, honesty, and justice. Then we also preserve art and cultures in order to keep them from the influence of globalization. We keep the natural resources and their environment balanced to support the efforts of improving the welfare and quality in human life. The seven ICMSE 2020 brings interesting team accelerating innovative research from laboratory to industry. This team intended to strengthen the collaboration between universities and the industry which is increasingly perceived as a vehicle to enhance innovation through knowledge exchange. Its development and the presence of faculty of mathematics and natural science, UNES, 
is expected to be able to discuss in answering various problems that rise in the current and future expectation how laboratory and industry works together. This ICMSE 2020 definitely supports the vision of UNES dealing with environmental prevention through innovation research. Ladies and gentlemen, collaboration between universities and industry have given leave to many blockbuster discoveries over the year. This is the picture how university and industry need to work in one hand. UNES invite and very welcome to, to the collaborative model where it be university, laboratory, industry, collaborate in joint research, hearing and exchange, exchange, licensing and contribute to the society in different ways. Through real-time relationship and direct technology transfer university, laboratory and industry together will produce new opportunities or market demand, such as new product, new ventures, and new industries, start, startup company. Government support will give positive cooperation to take place, provide stable society, encouragement and protect the interest of the people. As the conservation university, the development of research mainly current in environmental and natural science. Regarding to the current issue, these are research product and innovation. I can show you several in very interesting product such as Tangram for math education, high value and resource cooker to prepare bandung presto, natural days for batik. We also develop mobile desa in cooperation with Ministry of Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, there are shining example of fruitful collaboration between university, industry, partners, and startup in UNES. Finally, it is expected this ICMSE, which has 30,013 presenters, can produce significant and valuable ideas and also design the fullest possible contribution to the education system, both in Indonesia and the world. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman, for your presentation and sharing the keynote speech. Let's give reaction of applause for Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now we will have a photo session. Now, would you please activate your camera? I will count one, two, three, and please be ready. One, two, three. Okay, the first slide. The second slide. One, two, three. Go to the third slide. 
Okay, and now fourth slide. The fifth slide. Okay, finished. Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the very moment that we have been waiting for, the plenary session. The first plenary session will be from notable speakers, Assistant Professor Dr. Aditya P. Adirija from University of Arizona, USA, Assistant Professor Dr. Chang Lora Dengnam from Prince Songkla University, Thailand, and Associate Professor Dr. Stephen Bresson from National University of Singapore, Singapore. And the presentation will be guided by Dr. Zainal Abidin. Before we start the first session, I'd like to present the profile of the moderator. Dr. Zainal Abidin is the lecturer of Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Universitas Negeri Semarang. He is now an assistant professor in computer science. For moderator, time is all yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the first plenary session. I'm Dr. Zainal Abidin. It is a privilege for me to be your moderator today. In this session, we have three speakers. Uh, they are Assistant Professor Aditya P. Adirija, PhD from the University of Arizona. Good evening, Dr. Adi. Good evening, Dr. Abidin. Okay. Uh, what time is it in uh, Arizona? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's good morning over there in Indonesia. Uh, it's uh, uh, almost 7 p.m. here in the United States. Okay, 7 p.m. Okay, some audience may be curious about uh, you, Dr. Adi, because your name is so Indonesia. And yes, he used to live in Indonesia. Which part of Indonesia did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Jakarta. In and Jakarta. I, I moved to the United States when I was 15. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining us, although it's already evening in Arizona. And then our next speaker is from Thailand's Assistant Professor Dr. Talongrat Daingam. Uh, how do I call your name? Hello, uh, Dr. Talongrat. Can you hear my voice? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, you pronounce correctly. Chalongrat Dengam. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sawadikap. Sawadikap. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's all I can say in Thai. <laughs> okay. Assistant Professor Dr. Chalongrat Dengam is from Department of Physics, Faculty of Science, Prince of Songkla University. And then uh, we also have a speaker from Singapore, Associate Professor Stephen Preston from Department of Computer Science, National University of Singapore. Good morning, Prof. Stephen. How are you? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank Good you. morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before our speakers uh, deliver their talk, let me give you some information for all the conference participants in this plenary session. There's a rule that must be followed to ensure uh, this session runs smoothly. The host will disable the chat box during the presentation and the chat box will be reopened 10 minutes before the speaker uh, finishes his talks. If you have any question for the speaker, you can type your question on Zoom chat box or you can ask directly by hitting up the raise hand icon in Zoom apps. Now it's time Dr. Adi is our speaker to deliver his presentation. But before he starts, let me read his short biography. Aditya P. Adirja PhD is assistant professor at Department of Mathematics, the University of Arizona. He holds bachelor's degree in mathematics from University of California, Berkeley. Master degree in mathematics from University of California, Berkeley, and he accomplished his PhD in mathematic education also from the same university. In 2014 to 2015, he took postdoctoral program in Oregon State University. Since 2015, he's been an assistant professor in mathematics department at the University of Arizona, where he regularly teach linear algebra and number theory. He got Association of Mathematics Teacher Educators Service Teaching and Research Program Fellow in 2016 to 2017. In 2019, he got Spirit of Arizona Science Engineering and Mathematics Scholars 
Program Award from the University of Arizona. He has many experiences of being speakers and panelists, either in national or international outreach. This research has been published in international journal as well as conference proceeding. Dr. Adi, you have 25 minutes to deliver your talk. The time is now yours. Thank you, Dr. Abidin. Uh, let me see where I want to go here. Sorry, one second. Um, okay, let's <laughs> um, present. Come on. Let's see, the time from the beginning. All right, can everybody see my screen? Um, yes? Yes. Dr. Abidin, can you confirm yes. that? Thank you very much. Um, uh, honored guests and uh, organizing committee, this is a great, great honor for me to be here and to deliver my talk. Uh, the title of my talk is An Anti-Deficit Perspective on the Mathematical Thinking of Marginalized Students from Counter-Narrative to Creative Thinking. And uh, Dr. Abidin, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And I think um, listening to the Honorable Pro uh, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman M. Hum, um, um, uh speech from this morning, I think uh, my talk specifically will sort of focus a lot on the issues of justice, humanity, and culture as we think about the relationship between research and, um, and industry. And um, as you might have heard during the introduction, I am Indonesian, so I can speak Indonesian, uh, but I did not grow up uh, sort of speaking the academic language of Indonesian. So in the slides, there will be translations that I have prepared and hopefully it doesn't sound strange, uh, but I hope that was that, that's going to be helpful. And Dr. Abidin, if I speak too fast, please don't hesitate to slow me down and I'll be happy to oblige. Um, yeah. So um, this is an opening activity uh, that I want everybody to sort of just take a couple of minutes uh, to think about. And what you have on the slide is a definition of basis from linear algebra. So my research is in undergraduate mathematics education. Um, and so you have definition of uh, basis and what I want you to do is think about how might you explain the concept of basis using an idea from your day-to-day -day life or other contexts that might be familiar to you. So I'm gonna give you about just a couple of minutes to, to be thinking about that. And we will revisit this at the, uh, towards the end of the, um, the presentation. All right, you will uh, have more time to, do, to be thinking about this later, uh, but I just want you to keep this activity in mind because the data that I will share with you today will look at how students respond to this, um, to this question and the use of this question in, in thinking about anti-deficit approach in mathematics education and specifically thinking about the opportunities for creativity. As I looked through the, the conference programs, I saw a lot of talks in math education with interest in mathematical creativity. So I hope that this is of interest to you. Okay, um, there you go. 
So um, the motivation for anti-deficit approach or perspective in mathematics education for marginalized students specifically is um, the history of um, deficit stories about marginalized students in research um, in mathematics education specifically. So this has been documented by Lisa de Roth in 2019, by Frade, Asioli, Regnier, and June in 2013. And recently I wrote a handbook, uh, research handbook chapter about this as well. And what you will uh, see here are two quotes um, describing students. The first one is from a teacher, a public school teacher, grade five to eight, that's, who is describing student um, as low, as, at an academic level, jadi level ak uh, akademiknya rendah. Um, uh, sosial dan budayanya juga rendah. Edukasinya juga rendah. Semua rendah, ya. Yeah? And the the, not only are they focusing on how low uh, the, the, the levels of the students, but they also attribute uh, the reason for it um, um, to be the home, the student's home, the student's genetic problems um, associated with learning. So it's not only focused on the, on the negative of what the students cannot do, but also attributing it to the student's culture and family and background. And a similar account you can read from this uh, research sort of uh, claim about Mexican American children um, and arguing that the, the socialization that they receive at home is not conducive to, um, to their education. Basically blaming kind of family ties, you know, conexiama kuarga, uh, honor, masculinity, and this idea of just wanting to live in the present and not wanting to delay gratification, uh, those kinds of things have been sort of attributed to why Mexican-American students are not su successful in school. So on the one hand, there is this general deficit stories about students from marginalized backgrounds. Um, jadi siswa-siswa yang uh, tertinggir, uh, tertinggir, I think that's the right word. Um, and, but on the other hand, there's also um, examples of deficit stories about students' mathematical thinking. And this is actually the focus of my research, is thinking about why is there such a prevalence? Why is it so common? Uh, for researchers, specifically in mathematics education, who study the way that people think about mathematics, um, to focus on the deficit, to focus on what students cannot do, the mistakes that they, they, they commit, the errors, the misconceptions, right? So these are two examples from top tier journals in our field. So one is Educational Studies in Mathematics, another one is Journal of Mathematical Behavior. And the claim is, is that students would not notice a contradiction between the formal definition and their private conception. Jadi mereka nggak bisa sadar akan kontradiksi di antara uh, definisi formal dan mereka punya uh, uh, konsep pribadi ya. And all of this is about students' inability to interpret and to understand even in the second one about linear algebra, it's all about um, students do not remember. Perhaps they did not even initially understand, so they might not even understood in the first place. Um, and all of this points to deficiency. So my research kind of combines these sort of like uh, investigate, examine um, these two deficit stories about students' mathematical thinking and also about marginalized students. So how do you define deficit perspectives on marginalized students and their mathematics? So in my work, uh, in my collaboration with um, Dr. Nicole Louie in the United States, uh, we realized that there are three principles. One is focus on inherent problems in students' knowledge and their intellectual ability with little or no recognition of their existing understandings or resources. 
And also, like I said before, it attributes the problem to students or shortcomings, even perhaps their family or their culture, right? So let's see here. And the deficit perspective on sense making specifically, when we kind of want to think about uh, students' mathematical sense making, it begins with the assumption that without intervention or even sometimes with intervention, students' understanding of mathematical ideas would be flawed. Jadi mengasumsi bahwa tanpa atau bahkan dengan intervensi, pemahaman siswa tentang ide-ide matematika itu selalu pasti ada, ada ke, uh, kelemahannya gitu ya. Um, and it's supported by principles that overprivilege formal knowledge, consistency in understanding, coherent or formal mathematical language, and immediate change in understanding. Understand that each of these values are not bad by themselves, but it's our fixation and our rigidity. Uh, jadi kita terlalu kaku gitu mengenai uh, hal-hal ini. And that contributes actually to um, uh, deficit perspective on sense making. So this is sort of the system of deficit narrative. So uh, as I talked about before, narratives about society and research, um, about students of color um, and their thinking and how that informs then a deficit perspective when we're looking at uh, the mathematical work by marginalized students and it leads to interpret a deficit interpretation of their work. And we produce then with our students a deficit story about their ability. And this story at the end then feeds back into the narratives, uh, deficit narratives from society and research. So um, this is the system that I constantly challenge in my research and in my work. Um, I also would like to acknowledge that there's been a lot of work about this over the years. But um, so if you might be familiar, the work of ethnomathematics, the principle behind that or the motivation behind that is to challenge deficit narratives about people from particular culture and the contributions that they make to mathematics. So this, the work that I do is very much consistent to, to that existing work that has been around for some time now. So this is a summary of the deficit model. And so one of the things that I realized that I found in my research is that one of the challenges in looking at students' work is sometimes, most of, often, we focus on mathematical limitations. So errors and precisions and coherence. So when we're looking at students' work, this is the kind of thing that we often more easily see. And so what the summary of a deficit model is that when those mathematical limitations, when they're met with stringent, so rigid conception of mathematics, so what counts as mathematics, and other deficit narratives about students and marginalized students specifically, then they are interpreted as indicators of students' deficiency. Jadi mereka jadi um, mathematical limitations ini jadi ke kaya tanda kekurangannya murid-murid di PS di siswa. And in turn, at the end, we produce a deficit story about students. So the question is, what's an alternative? So an alternative model is we can still look at mathematical limitations. But when they're met with broader conceptions uh, of mathematics, including a focus on creativity, uh, they can be interpreted as opportunities for mathematical creativity and hopefully in turn can produce a story of productive sense making. So this is the data illustration that I'm going to share with you all. Um, it is about, uh, this is the question that I ask students. Can you think of an example from your everyday life that describes the idea of basis? Um, and how does your example reflect your meaning of basis? What does it capture and what does it not? And the point of this data illustration is to show you the product of anti-deficit uh, approach to mathematics education, which is the first is a developing counter narrative. Um, and um, also thinking about issues of creativity. So counter narratives is, um, is basically a story that challenge deficit master narrative. So it's a story that break assumptions about students, especially those who are struggling. And so in this study, I, I asked the same question, uh, actually a professor, a math professor, 
decided to ask the question as part of homework. And this is what one student responded. So maybe this is one of the things, one of the ideas that you came up with. But the student talk about basis in terms of having a paint box with all your basic colors, red, blue, yellow, black, and white. And then you make a painting on a sheet of paper and then you use only red paint. Now pretend you have another painting, this time you only use black and white paint. Um, each paper that you use for a painting is a different space. So the students are talking about different factor spaces, different subspaces, or uh, I think in Indonesian it's called uh, subruangan, the um, uh, linear algebra. And the basic colors of the paint box are the basis of your painting. And then talking about you cannot make any of the colors in the paint box from other colors, talking about the issues of linear independence. Um, and then, so this is something that the students were able to come up with. And I have to note that even though I teach linear algebra for some years, when my colleague Michelle Sandier and I try to think of different examples or different ideas from our everyday lives to describe basis, we probably came up with one or two recipes or cooking is one of the ones that are quite common. Um, but aside from, or like building uh, Legos, uh, that's another common one. But aside from that, we, we struggled in coming up with, 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 uh, with examples. When we, in, we invite students to do this, specifically in the United States, uh, we work with a group of women of color, so uh, non-white uh, female students. Um, and we ask them about this. All together, just with eight women, they came up with 22 different contexts and ideas to come up with, uh, to explain the concept of basis. And this establishes a different story about the participation of women and specifically women of color in mathematics. So this is what the, the instructor of the course said. What a fantastic example. I love how you found basis for multiple spaces, excellent work. And then she also shared with me that the student who wrote the paint box example, and, and there's actually more to the student's explanation, actually struggled with traditional assignments and exams and had to obtain a tutor for the course. But according to the teacher, and I agree, her example was well-developed. Um, she was she criti critically analyzed um, and it was quite different from um, a typical vector space of RN. Um, she, she described it as the student having a deep, broad, intuitive, and conceptual understanding of basis. So the other one that I wanna talk about is this idea of creativity and mass limitation. So this is, I'm um, giving you two other examples from two different students. The first student, this was from the study with a group of women of color. Um, she talks about it in terms of us having a storage room, and so she said that the a basis is more, it's kind of like the dimension of the room. Um, and you can fill it with how much uh, you have, how much room you have. Simon, on the other hand, a different student, talks about this idea of building a house and talking about the, um, the elements like wood and stone and glass. Jadi ada kayunya, batunya, dan kacanya ya untuk untuk to build a house. Um, and so I was wondering, um, well, part of it is I, if you look at their explanation, one of the things that we can focus is focus on is the limitations of these examples. The examples are rather vague. There are certain things that are of issue, and actually, the students themselves recognize that. Jadi uh, siswa-siswa ini uh, tahu sendiri ada kalau ini emang uh, contoh ini ada kekurangannya sedikit ya. So and the very serious limitation is the fact that their example kind of describes a finite vector space, um, and vector space has to be an infinite, and so their examples are rather finite. Oh. So Eliana talks about, yeah, sort of, but I don't think that really applies because basis is the least amount in order to cover an entire space. And basis is just a representation of an unlimited area. So the student understands that a vector space, um, 
ruangan vektor ya uh, itu harus infinite so and then she said that her example doesn't describe that. and so this is a situation where a mathematical limitation can actually dismiss the a creative product as mathematically nonsensical and thus closing down the creative process okay so that's rule number one and then with simon uh let's see here he said, oh, maybe it's, uh, it's good that, to see that you have three different, completely different um, in the linearly independent elements, but maybe you can't get the vector of the uh, vector space of the house. Maybe it's difficult to see that. I guess the, the vector space would be everything you can build from stone, glass, and wood. So instead of talking just about the house, the student talks about build, now building everything and anything from stone, glass, and wood, which is actually quite accurate. It could be a house or it could be something else. So this is talking about another role of mathematical limitation. It can inform the revision of a creative product that's continuing the creative process. So mathematical limitation can, um, can give this, can actually extend the creative process. Um, here's another one, cooking. Uh, the student said, oh, you know, you can have a basis of one egg. Satu telur untuk, untuk masak. Tapi masak apa ya? Um, and she said, well, well, I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, but if maybe if I'm only given a tablespoon of something, right? She's, she's really struggling to identify what can I do with this in terms of basis. And she at the end, she just said, I don't think this captures basis. I'm not going to do this. Um, and then what her main argument is that... Um, the point of a basis is to span something. Um, I don't think eggs and sugar, they're like apples and oranges. You cannot really combine them. But if you think about driving, maybe you can drive one block north, one block south, um, or not south, but uh, east, west. I think those spaces you can get anywhere in the world. And so what we see here is this is an example of a mathematical limitation motivating a new creative product to address a limitation of a previous product. Um, and then there's uh, another one here where she ended up uh, collaborating with the interviewers to think about what you can make with, uh, with egg and sugar. Uh, and so the idea is, is that you can revise a creative product and construct new ones when you work in collaboration with other people. So mathematical limitations in summary can do one of these uh, four things. So it can dismiss a creative product as nonsensical. Um, it can inform the revision of creative product con that's continuing the creative process. It can motivate new creative products to address the limitation. And in interaction, it can actually revise and construct new ones. And all of this together can be an opportunity to write a counter story about student struggle in mathematics. So kesimpulan utamanya ini di sini is mathematical limitations, kekurangan-kekurangan dalam matematika yang biasanya itu sesuatu tanda khas dari kelemahan dalam pemahaman from an anti-deficit perspective can instead be interpreted as opportunity for creativity and opportunity to develop a counter story for marginalized. And so the implications here is, is that narratives in society about different groups of students actually matter very much in education. And instead of being skeptical of students' understanding, we should be skeptical of our current ability to assess understanding. And it's not about, and I'm not advocating that you look away from errors. It's not about not looking at limitations, but changing our interpretations of these limitations. But this research was done in the context of the United States. Um, so I don't know who would count as marginalized students in your context, in Samarang, for example. Um, and I want you to answer that question. Who are your marginalized students? And what deficit narratives are you challenging? That's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Eddie, for your fruitful presentation. And yeah, I think we will next with uh, next our uh, presenters.
Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, our next presenter is Assistant Professor Dr. Changlong Radaingam. Uh, but before we start, before uh, Dr. Changlong Rad start his talk, let me read his short biography first. The operator, could you please share the short biography? Okay, thank you. Assistant Professor Dr. Changlong Radaingam is Assistant Professor at Department of Physics, Faculty of Science, Prince of Songkla University. He holds bachelor degree in physics from Prince of Songkla University, Thailand, and then master's degree in nanoelectronics and nanomechanics from Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Leeds, United Kingdom. And he accomplished his PhD in nonlinear optics area from Department of Physics, Virginia Technology, USA. Professor Chan Longrat has research interest in nonlinear optics, laser physics, stimulated Raman spectroscopy, optical instruments, multispectral imaging, IR imaging, multifunctional nanomaterials, plasmonic nanomaterials, high precision bottom down fabrications using selective surface functionalization of nanoparticles and macromolecules. The research has been published in international journals as well as conference proceeding. Professor Talongrat, the time is all yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Abidin, for a nice introduction. So um, everyone can hear me, right? Yes. OK, great. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> all right. So, um, uh, good morning, everyone. Do you hear my, my PowerPoint screen, right? Uh, do you see, right? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, good morning again, everyone. Uh, I am... Uh, we, haven't, we haven't seen your uh, PowerPoint slide. Okay. Let me check. Okay. All right. uh, thank you again, Dr. Abidin, for a nice introduction. So today, my topic that I'm going to talk today is um, about the, some research in the area of optics and photonics. So it's called Nano Second Pump Resonant Random Raman Lasing, along with machine learning for chemical detection and identification from, from long distance. Um, before I go into the talk detail, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, introduce our university and our research group and facilities, hoping that um, in the future we can have some sort of collaboration because we are not so far. And actually we have uh, many Indonesian students in our university right now and they are really good. So we are welcome all of you. Um, uh, we are seeking for, a, a, it could be a student or academic exchange and graduate level study is also uh, so possible. We provide some scholarship as well. Um, and I think everyone knows this is uh, Thailand and our university located um, near the, in the southern part of Thailand, near the Malaysian border. Uh, I think it's about 200, um, 2,500 kilometers away from your university. Um, if you zoom into the map, um, our university is here and um, my lab is in the Faculty of Science, which you can notice a landmark of the pumpkin building and we have nanophotonic laboratory inside the building behind there. We also have another facility, it's not so far away, about 30 kilometers. It's called Optic and Photonics Center, uh, which is belong to National Astronomical Research uh, Institute of Thailand, or we call NARIT, which is actually a very nice facility on the top of the mountain. So you can uh, actually see a very good view of, of the ocean. And uh, here is my group, uh, Nanophotonics. Actually, it's a very, very new group. It's about four or five years old group. Um, we um, working on variety of subjects in the areas of optics and photonics, and also include some 
um, research on optical nanostructure material as well. And the current topic that we are uh, carrying on right now is um, standoff from uh, explosive detection system. So basically we build optical system to detect hazardous or explosive chemicals from, from long distance. We also um, do intensive photonics and optics designs and optimization to build optical system for a sensor or detection. And we also have some collaboration with local industry uh, like Seagate, the world number two hard drive producer in order to produce some um, detection system, um, some optical tools for them as well. And recently we, the COVID-19 system, we are also um, conduct some AI imaging technology and we try to improve the temperature reading to, uh, to be very I mean, more accurate by adding some sensor and using uh, black body calibrators to get more accurate uh, reading from, from the uh, infrared. We also have the lady over here working on uh, mid infrared laser from quantum, quantum wave nanostructure semiconductor. And we also have the professor over here working on quantum optics and quantum communication using uh, polarization of lights as qubits. And this is um, our group. We also have a good collaboration with optic and photonic centers um, from the read at Song Clai, if I told you before, led by Dr. Christoph Boisitz. Uh, he working on telescope designs, uh, spectroscopy, coronography, and adaptive optics um, designs and building the system. Basically, there are lots of uh, internship and scholarship for student and academic stuff that are interested to do some short time research in this facility. We, we are really welcome. If you are interested, you can email me, but um, I'm not quite sure about the regulation during night, COVID-19, maybe we have to wait a little bit until the country is fully open again. Uh, anyway, if you are interested, we are really welcome uh, the internship student as well. Okay, let's come back to to my talk about the nanosecond uh, pump resonant random Raman lasing along with machine learning for chemical identification from distance. Basically, we are uh, decide and make the optical system based on Raman spectroscopy in order to detect and identify the the molecular type or the compositions of the target. Uh, well, we want the target made of what kind of material we can use this uh, detection system to, to identify uh, from long distance. And <clears throat> the, main, the main mechanism that we are using is Raman spectroscopy. I believe that uh, some of you might have uh, known Raman spectroscopy very well because it's a standard technique in laboratory. Actually, Raman spectroscopy is laser-based non-invasive technique uh, used to detect and ident identify target molecules based on elastic material, in, in elastic scattering from the materials. Basically, when you shine a laser onto the molecules, it's emit, uh, it will absorb light and re-emit um, fractions of light with different wavelengths. So you can use that uh, different wavelengths to identify the molecules of the target. This technique find a lot of application, for example, forensic and industrial application. Okay, I go back. So you can use it to identify forensic materials or some material in the, in the processing. They can also use for medical application to detect cancer or some biomolecules or we are using it to detect explosive materials or some hazardous material that you don't want to go close to them. And uh, you may have heard about the, the detection system that also include into uh, a rover in order to, to go into some planet like Mars and do some mineral analysis or some uh, material analysis using laser and uh, laser-based detection techniques. So they will know what kind of materials on the 
on the surface of the planet. Um, so basically, most of Raman spectroscopy, they use um, a standard or a conventional, conventional Raman process uh, that can be explained by a simple energy diagram. So when uh, a light with lambda zero incident up on the molecules, there are several process can take place. The majority one is the elastic scattering. So you get light excite electron and then it's going to upper energy levels and going down to the same step. So this one is, uh, doesn't give you any information because the, the energy of the incoming and the energy of outgoing is the same. But you also have the inelastic scattering or Raman scattering, which, are, which is two kinds of them. Uh, we have Stoke Raman where the output uh, photon has lower energy than the in incident photon. And we also have a case that the output photon has higher energy as well, but it has low probability. So we don't care about it. So basically the molecule absorbs and then use some energy for vibration and emit the photon which lets energy. And the difference of the energy here is characterized by Raman chip, which is the term that scientists use. And the Raman chip is very specific to the molecules. For example, here, the TNT or the other molecules here have different Raman spectrum. And it's very good to use for a sensors to identify material. However, Raman efficiency is very low. So you don't get very strong Raman signal. The efficiency is uh, like 10 to negative 10 to negative eight. So it's very hard to detect even, even uh, a close range equipment, but we are trying to do for a long range detection. Therefore, um, we need to build uh, quite a bulky uh, system to detect the Raman signal from the distance. And we need to use uh, laser with high peak power. And this is our system, consists of nanosecond pulse laser, produce a very short power laser with high peak power. And the wavelength is about 355 nanometer. And we use telescope to collect the light, the scatter light from distance. We use an optical filter set to filter unwanted component, and we use Grayson to disperse Raman spectrum. And the most important component is micro channel plate intensifier. This is um, the, the optical amplification unit. So you can get stronger signal before detecting by the cool CMOS camera. Um, basically you can see the spectrum of the Raman scattering from material that we excite from long distance. Um, although you, you may have a good optical system, but it's still challenging to detect Raman signal because it's very weak. Because the Raman process be, uh, mostly based on spontaneous emission, which is very weak. So we are seeking for another type of Raman process, which is enhance uh, efficiency more than the usual one. And when we think about the optical process that could generate intense light, uh, one of the answer that uh, would be into our mind is the laser process because the laser is very strong light. Therefore, we want to generate not a spontaneous Raman, but we, we want to, to generate a laser of Raman from long distance. And how do we do? Um, how can we do that? How can we make a laser emission from long distance? Um, so, what are the components need for producing the laser? Basically, the convention, for the conventional laser, you need two com components at least, which is the laser materials. And you need optical feedback, which um, can be provided by a pair of mirrors. So you have the oscillation of light back and forth and the light can be trapped in the, between the mirrors. However, that's not realistic. You cannot put mirrors um, 
at the target that you want to detect every time. That's not realistic. So we are seeking for another kind of laser phenomenon, which is called random lasing. So basically in random lasing process, you don't need mirrors. So what you need is just random structures or disordered structure of the materials to produce multiple scattering and can produce optical feedback to trap the light into the structures. Therefore, in order to produce random Raman lasing, we need, we need two components. First of all, we need Raman medium or Raman material, which is the material that we want to detect. And the second one, we need optical feedback, which generally um, can be um, obtained by the powder form of the material that we want to detect. So basically, we cannot get the random Raman lasing from homogeneous medium. It has to be disordered structure like powder. And once you have these two components, you can get very bright emission from Raman la uh, lasing process coming out. Okay. And before I'm measuring Raman spectrum, we need to test our system with standard spectrum uh, from mercury emission to calibrate spectrum and to investigate spectral resolution. So uh, we can compare our the system obtained from our our system, which is the bottom spe uh, bottom spectrum here is the spectrum from our system, and the red spectrum here is the spectrum obtained from uh, the commercial system. We could see uh, we got pretty nearly the same uh, spectrum resolution even we are measuring at longer distance. So the spectral resolution is about 1.97 nanometer, which is equivalent to the Raman resolution about 102 centimeter inward, which is not very high resolution, I could say that, but it still be able to, to use for this application. Uh, we can also show that the spectrum qualities of our system when measured for the materials 20 meter away is quite similar uh, with the spectrum obtained from the system that measure in close range uh, device. So it's good. And for the Raman lasing process can be observed through the Raman lasing threshold characteristic, which is the relationship between the Raman scattering signal and the laser intensity. So basically the Raman threshold characteristic also depends on the structure of material as well. So we test it by using two different structure. The first one is the original powder form and the second one, we compress it to form a high density pellet. And then we measure for the Raman threshold, uh, the lacing threshold characteristic. So once we increase the pump uh, intensity beyond the threshold level, we can notice the lacing phenomena happens. So you can see a big jump in uh, output energy, output uh, intensity of the Raman signal. And we got the efficiency on the order of 10 to the negative four, which is much higher than 10 to the negative eight from the conventional Raman. And we are be, uh, by using this, uh, our device and our random Raman lasing technique together, we be able to detect um, various materials, for example, barium nitrate, sodium nitrate, barium sulfate from very long distance with clear peaks and high signal to noise ratio. So even 30 meters, we can still detect the Raman signal quite, quite clearly. And we have very good sensitivity as well. At the distance of 30 meters, we can detect Raman power down to picowatt level with signal to noise ratio very high, about eight. However, although the system show good sensitivity, but the, I can say that the, the spectral resolution is not uh, yet very high. 
fundamentally, you need to trade the resolution with the sensitivities. And in order to keep the sensitivity high, you need to accept that the, the spectrum is not very, uh, is, can, be, can be low in resolution. And sometimes it's hard to make a classification of target materials, especially the material that uh, provide very similar Raman spectrums like barium nitrate, barium sulfate, urea, or uh, potassium nitrate, sodium nitrate, or lead nitrate. They are a group of material that provide quite similar Raman peaks. And if you use very, if you use the low resolution system, so, uh, you may not be able to classify these materials easily. Therefore, recently we tried to adopt uh, a machine learning algorithm uh, to make uh, a model, a classification model to classify for this spectrum. And uh, we working on, we start with very simple uh, machine learning algorithm with this convolutional neural network architecture consists of uh, the input layer which is 1D array containing Raman spectrum here. And then we use five layers of convolutional filters to detect a features, the peak features of the, the spectrums. And we use a multi-layer neural network to as a classification layer. At the beginning, we use the output layer uh, as a six of the materials. For each training, we use 200 spectrums of each material for to do machine learning. And here is the classification results in terms of confusion metrics. So basically the confusion metric is a tables that are often used to describe the performance of the classification models um, by display the prediction. Here is the prediction models were such the targeted materials. So for example, if the target is the urea, you can see that the model doesn't give any wrong prediction of the urea to some others, some other materials. So the wrong prediction is mostly, mostly zeros, except one material that we still get some wrong prediction like barium nitrate. So we get 3.3 wrong prediction to the lead nitrate but it's a quite small percentage. So the overall, the classification performance of the SIG material is about 96.7%. So this is my conclusion. We built the optical system to detect the Raman spectroscopy from distance to detect uh, chemical uh, materials. And we use the powder form with high, pulse, high peak power of the laser in order to produce Raman lasing with high efficiency. So we can detect the Raman signal with high signal ratio, signal to noise ratio from this distance of 30 meters. And we try to use a convolutional neural network model to classify those materials with very high um, percent of the correctness. And thank you very much. This is all for me, my talk. Well, thank you, uh, Prof. Talongrat. That's very interesting information from you, Prof. Talongrat. And ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Associate Professor Stephen Bresson. But before he start his talk, let me read his short biography. The operator, could you please share his short biography, please? Oh, maybe Prof. Tanglorat? Okay, thank you. Stephen Bresson is Associate Professor in the Computer Science Department of the School of Computing of the National University of Singapore. Stephen received a PhD in Computer Science in 1992 from the University of Lille, France. In 1990, Stephen had joined the European Computer Industry Research Center of Bull, ICL and Siemens in Munich, Germany. From 1996 to 1998, he was research associate at the Sloan School of Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, United States of America. Stephen has developed expertise in data management and analysis, as well as in 
data driven modeling, simulation and optimization with data mining and machine learning algorithms. Stephens is the principal investigator of several projects in data analytics and data privacy. Stephens is the author or co-author of more than 180 articles in journals and conferences, books, chapters, and books. Stephen contributes to the disseminations of research in and outside his research community in participating in the organization of several international conferences and workshops and in contributing to editorial boards of several journals. Today, Professor Stepan will talk about science machine can learn. Professor Stepan, the 25 minutes is all yours. I shared my screen. I yes. hope everybody can see it. Yeah, you can see it. So, thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to join you for this conference. I um, learn uh, about the conference uh, when uh, Prof. Zenal contacted me uh, and I discovered the university and the conference uh, and that's that's very interesting. Uh, as our colleague from uh, Prince Songlai University mentioned, we are geographically very near and uh, it makes sense for all of us to collaborate. So for instance, I am working with uh, uh, as is uh, Nanta Mompong from uh, Prince Songkla University. Uh, okay. He is uh, in the computer science department, the, co the computing school. It's even, if I may say, it's even a better campus because it's on the island of Phuket. So very near the, the touristic beaches there. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm also collaborating with colleagues from University of Indonesia, uh, Udayana University, uh, in Bali and many others through uh, Apticom, which uh, may be the computer science uh, um, faculty members uh, in the audience would uh, be familiar with, is the association of uh, uh, computing uh, researchers and, and teachers in, in Indonesia. And we hope next uh, Professor Stepan can collaborate with Universitas Negeri Semarang. Absolutely, that, that's that's where I'm coming to. Uh, the, the reason, one of the reason I, I'm uh, very interested in giving this talk now is maybe to uh, trigger some uh, collaboration, some interest. So this is how I've been structuring uh, the talk. The question I want to uh, discuss is whether uh, machines, and we're all thinking about, of course, computers and artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, whether these machines can, uh, can learn uh, science or can create science. So this is what I want to talk about today. Um, before we start, let me uh, show you a short video. Uh, I Maybe I need to do something. I'm not sure I set up my uh, zoom properly. Uh, let me see. Give me a second. I need to share my computer sound so that you can see the video. You can hear the video. So this is the scientific method described by a famous scientist, uh, famous physicist, Richard Feynman. Situation. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> then we com well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply. And then we compare those computation results to nature. Or we say compared to experiment or experience compare it directly with observation to see if it if it works <coughs> if it disagrees with experiment it's wrong in that simple statement is the key to science it doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is it doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made your gas uh, tube uh, at the time used to uh, help some uh, physics used to uh, do some uh, physics experiments is uh, a paper uh, by uh, Wynne Williams written in 1931. So gas tubes 
are really the older, older versions of uh, uh, our computers today. And uh, these gas tubes are called teratron. You see a picture here on the slide of, of a teratron. Uh, it's not in use, of course, uh, anymore today. We have uh, silicon uh, processors, but uh, this was the first paper where somehow electrical computing devices were used for science. So can machine help create science? Well, uh, yes. Um, we have plenty of examples where we are going to use um, computers and we are going to use programs to uh, process the results uh, of experiments. I think we had a, a great example from our colleague from Thailand, where he's using machine learning to classify some of the measurements that uh, he can do for uh, his uh, physics uh, experiments. Um, so uh, if you want to do so, you need to have platforms for statistical analysis, uh, maybe languages like Python, R, SQL, if you have a lot of data, uh, and uh, possibly quite importantly, especially in physics, uh, some efficient uh, numerical computation uh, frameworks and programming languages like C, Fortran. And maybe some of you may have heard about a quite recent language, which is focusing on numerical computation, which is called Julia. Uh, if you haven't, I recommend that you take a look at Julia. It's probably going to be an important language uh, for scientists, uh, physicists, uh, chemists, mathematicians, uh, environmental scientists, etc. And of course, the hardware is important because we possibly have a lot of data or complex computations. So we need parallel computing hardware and infrastructures. Another very important thing is not just to be able to process uh, the data that is coming from uh, measurements from experiments, but um, as you know, um, Experiments are often very expensive to organize in real life. And uh, you can actually create interesting data to analyze and to verify uh, scientific hypotheses from simulations. So the role of simulations in science is uh, as if not more important than it is in uh, engineering. Uh, so there again, uh, you need even more uh, computer computing uh, uh, powerful uh, computing uh, infrastructures and language. Again, C, Fortran, Julia that I mentioned, and again, the parallel computing hardware and infrastructures. So processing data and uh, creating data through simulations. This is what we know how to do. We have witnessed such things for several decades already. This is where computing is able to help uh, science. Now, one of the question is, can we go beyond that? Is it just there to um, help verify uh, hypotheses? Can machine help find and formulate uh, hypotheses? Maybe it can by using, uh, for instance, machine learning models uh, to create models or even simple statistical models to create models of the data. And uh, those models usually, if you think about it, are created by uh, a process of optimization. So you are trying to find the model that best fit uh, the data. And in order to do so, you usually take existing concepts uh, and you try to combine them to create that model that best fit uh, the data. This is where probably at this point in uh, time, in the evolution of uh, computing, uh, we have we start to have very powerful tools in the form of machine learning models, uh, neural networks, and then if you do that, you need to look at uh, the uh, programming frameworks and platforms like TensorFlow, CRASS, and again the parallel computing hardware. And in particular, for machine learning, you would be interested in uh, clusters 
of general purpose uh, graphic processing uh, units. So we, we have seen in the news the success of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and in particular, neural network. Uh, it is not a coincidence that the Turing Award, in which is like the Nobel Prize of computer science, uh, it is it is not a, a coincidence that this uh, Turing Award was given to three researchers uh, who contributed to the success of uh, neural network. So uh, Geoffrey Hinton, Jan Lecun, and Joshua uh, Bengio. So these uh, three researchers in, in their way for a long time have been pushing and uh, extending uh, the uh, algorithms and the models for neural network and machine learning. And basically, this success culminated with uh, the creation of such tools as uh, Google uh, DeepMind, for instance. You all have heard in the news about uh, these uh, new uh, machine learning models being able to beat humans as uh, such games as the uh, game of Go. Uh, I don't know if you have ever played the game of Go. Uh, I tried. Uh, it's it's a, a game of strategy. Uh, it's actually very difficult for a human. And now uh, you have computers able to beat the human masters uh, of this game. So this is where we are. Uh, computing can help verifying the hypothesis in the scientific process. Computing, especially machine learning, can start help building new hypotheses uh, for scientists. So now let's discuss what I'm particularly interested in with my team here in Singapore. And the reason why I'd like to talk to you, because if you are doing something or if you have interest in some similar things, I would like to invite you to contact me and maybe we can try and work together. Uh, I took a look at the uh, program this afternoon for the conference uh, in the physics uh, uh, sessions in particular. I see a lot of people uh, interested in studying uh, different kinds of uh, uh, dynamical systems. And uh, one of the things that will make computing help uh, the creation of science is uh, the increased ability for uh, machines to be informed about the underlying science. So the machine can help create science if it understands part of the scientific knowledge that we have already. And that knowledge uh, very often, whether it's in environmental sciences or even economy or physics uh, or, or biology, takes the form of a dynamical system, which is usually a system of uh, differential equations. So um, if you are interested in this topic, I recommend that you read uh, these two papers about two of, in my opinion, the important latest uh, advances in the domain. Uh, the first one is a, a Python library, which is called PySyndy, which is a package for the identification of uh, nonlinear dynamics in data. So you have data and you have, uh, and you want to figure out what are the, the dynamical system that go, what is the dynamical system that governs this data. So you can do that by program using this Python library, a very interesting uh, library. And the second paper that I recommend that you take a look at is uh, it got a best paper award in NIPS in 2018 is called Neural Ordinary Differential Equations. It's a paper that shows that actually neural networks can be used to uh, uh, solve or contribute to the solution of uh, systems of differential equations. And these two tools are going to be a connection between 
the world of data and the world of uh, differential equations and dynamical systems. But the bottom line, why neural networks are so powerful and so interesting is possibly uh, this notion of the universal approximation theorem, or in fact, there are several. So the universal approximation theorems. Artificial neural networks, even very simple ones with, <coughs> with just one hidden layer, if you are familiar with the architecture of neural networks, these are layers of uh, processing nodes, very simple processing nodes that are interconnected. Even a very simple uh, one layer neural network can approximate basically any function. And, and this is where the power of this machine learning neural network comes from. <coughs> um, the paper, the, the seminal paper that talks about this universal approximation theorem is uh, by George uh, Sibenko. Uh, I recommend you to take a look at it. I don't really recommend you to read it inside out. It's a little bit uh, on the uh, um, mathematics side, although I understand that there are many mathematicians in the audience. Maybe you can, you can take a look at the details, but it's important because it's pointing out at the uh, um, fundamental property that uh, creates the success of uh, neural networks. <coughs> of course, the second uh, important aspect of neural network is that, yes, they can uh, simulate pretty much any function, but it is not clear uh, how to set up a neural network to simulate a given function. Uh, there is no analytical way to calculate the weights of a network given the function. What you need to do is you need to go through uh, supervised or unsupervised uh, training. Uh, and here, the uh, important uh, feature of neural network and machine learning models is the gradient descent. Uh, those models are based on energy. So you need to uh, minimize or maximize the energy of the system to uh, reach uh, an optimal point. And that's where your system, your model is going to simulate the function that you are training it to, uh, to, to uh, learn. Uh, if you want to look at two important papers uh, by Hinton, uh, you have a paper on training uh, products of experts, so basically neural networks to minimize uh, contrastive uh, divergence. That's the gradient descent efficient gradient descent. And uh, if you want to understand why these models are based on minimizing or maximizing the energy, read the energy-based model for sparse uh, over complete representations. So these are two uh, very important uh, papers. And um, just to uh, wrap up the overview of uh, the uh, potential and important features of neural network, all this is possible. Uh, because where gradient descent, you can understand, is the computation of a derivative. So you need to be able to efficiently compute a derivative while you are training your network. And this can be done by automatic differentiation, which is basically the process of uh, taking a piece of code that computes a function and by program, transforming this code into another piece of code that computes the derivative of that function. So you do the de derivation, not analytically on a piece of paper like we all did uh, in, in high school, but you get a program to uh, compute the derivative of another program that computes a function. Uh, automatic differentiation in PyTorch, there's a library in PyTorch to uh, do these kind of things. I recommend that you take a look at that. This is extremely uh, timely and uh, important. So let me quickly go through some of the things we are doing here at NUS. So I'm, 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 work, I'm not a physicist at all, actually. I wasn't even very good at physics at school. I'm more of a, a mathematician and, and computer scientist. Uh, so I get to learn from those physicists about quantum many body systems. Uh, quantum many body system is a system of uh, particles 
uh, that uh, is governed by a Schrodinger equation. Uh, and uh, if you, you probably have heard about this notion of a spin, uh, and we maybe to, for simplicity, we'll talk about a spin, which is just uh, an arrow up uh, or down that sorts of uh, characterize the internal degree of freedom of, of, uh, of the particles. So uh, if you want to describe, if you want to understand a quantum many body uh, system, you need to know its wave function psi. And uh, if you want to understand how the system is evolving, you need to, uh, based on the, the different influences uh, inside and outside the system, you need to write is Hamiltonian. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, for instance, the Heising model or the Heisenberg model of quantum many body physics. Well, uh, it turns out that uh, you can very directly represent these quantum many body uh, systems as very simple uh, neural networks, which are called restricted Boltzmann machines. And uh, this paper by uh, Carlio and Troyer uh, uh, makes this connection. And uh, what happens uh, is that uh, you uh, are able to learn the wave function of a system. So you are able to understand a system uh, by unsupervised training, by just minimizing uh, the energy of the representation of your many body uh, system. So this is done by unsupervised training. Uh, uh, you can, uh, it's a kind of Monte Carlo method, which was known by the physicists. But what the physicists discover is that they can do that with neural networks. So what we have done is we have studied uh, transfer learning. We have shown that you can learn a neural network that represents a given system. And if you want to learn a neural network that represents a bigger system with more particles, uh, the only thing you need to do is take the one uh, smaller system and reuse it. You don't have to start from scratch uh, to learn for the bigger system. So you can go from one system of size n to a system of size 2n to a system of size 4n. So it gives, this gives you, uh, this speed ups the process of, uh, of going to large systems, and this gives you scalability. Uh, another thing that you can do with transfer learning is try and look at systems that are very near in terms of their parameters, but they are not exactly in the same uh, set settings for the parameters. So when you do that, uh, you are going to be able to study the evolution of the systems and their different phases. Uh, and in particular, what we were able to show is that you can characterize the phase transitions uh, of these uh, quantum uh, many body systems. So when uh, the uh, water becomes ice or when the water starts boiling and, and becomes gas, uh, there are such uh, phases or similar notions of phases in quantum many body systems. And we can characterize them using this transfer learning. So this is what we are doing. So now I want to conclude uh, this presentation by challenging you to think about this problem. Can machine help create science? So through the examples I have given, uh, you see that computers, artificial intelligence, machine learning like neural networks, definitely are very good tools to help the domain scientists. Uh, of course, the mathematician must come to help uh, deal with the maths and the computer scientist must come in the team to uh, help with the uh, algorithms and the programming. But all together with these tools, we can try and solve uh, difficult problems we are, which are usually combinatorial optimization problems. So where uh, science uh, problems is when you have uh, well, we were talking about linear algebra and vector spaces. Uh, here we have uh, generally Hilbert spaces, which are uh, vector spaces uh, where the vectors are functions. And these spaces have very many uh, dimensions. In the case of the quantum system I was talking about, if you have n particles, 
your vector space, your Hilbert space, are two at the, as two at the power of n uh, dimensions. So this um, this is where you need to do your optimization. That's why we need those tools because they can help us with combinatorial optimization. And uh, one of the way they're doing that is by uh, leveraging uh, nonlinear models. So basically they take usually very large, uh, high dimensionality uh, linear models and they reduce the dimensionality by transforming them into nonlinear models that can be solved by the machine learning tools. So yes, we are at a point where all this is happening in science. Machine can help create science by addressing high dimensional problems, optimization problems, and looking at mapping linear and nonlinear problems to uh, each other. But the question that maybe we can talk about uh, during the Q&A or offline is whether uh, machines can create science in the sense of whether a machine can create new concepts. And um, the answer, unfortunately, is that I don't know. But I'm wondering one thing. If uh, Occam razors is a good principle, is the principles are, are going for the simplest explanation, so the hypothesis or the theory should be the simplest explanation, uh, then it sounds like an optimization problem, right? If you can define simplest, then you just need to maximize simplicity or minimize complexity, right? So that could be uh, the way that uh, we can get machines to create uh, concepts. Uh, but then I'm curious to hear your opinion because I understand that in this conference, you have uh, teachers who are very versed in understanding the way we are thinking about science. And we have scientists who are practicing science uh, every day. So uh, maybe you can reflect on your own experience and help uh, contribute to answering these questions. So now that being said, uh, please take my presentation as an invitation for collaboration. So look at the different papers that I have mentioned throughout the presentation, read them. And if the ideas in those papers resonate, uh, feel free to contact me. I'm very keen to extend my network of collaboration uh, from Prince Songkla University of Indonesia and Udayana and Apticom uh, to UNES and all the other uh, uh, organizations of the participants today. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions, your emails and collaborations. Well, thank you uh, for your insightful presentation, Prof. Uh, Stephen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the presentation from our speakers in this session. And now we come to Q&A session. Uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, we can uh, use this 15 minutes for uh, Q&A and answers. Uh, there are some questions uh, on the chat box already. Uh, okay, let me read the question. Okay. Okay, I listed three questions uh, for uh, one question for its uh, speakers. Uh, first question uh, for Dr. Adi. Uh, you share us about anti deficit perspective in studying mathematical sense by a minoritized student you call as a counter narrative, an episode of uh, mathematical creativity from two diverse students in American and America and Germany. Is it, is it correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I am interested in the uh, deficit model you saw us, and then you met an alternative model as well. Uh, could you explain us how this model should be implemented in other contexts? Uh, for example, in Indonesia, that we have different sociocultural heritage. That's the question for Dr. Adi. And uh, next question for for Professor Salongrat. Uh, this, is, this question is uh, come from uh, Mr. Sepi Kurniawan from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Actually, you already responded the question, but the response is 
uh, came to me privately. So I need you to explain again to the audience. So the question is, will the environment such as uh, different temperature and humidity affect the result of long distance Raman spectra or on uh, the other word, is there any interference factors? Second question, is it possible to use your devices to do in situ investigation? So uh, maybe Pak Jepi or others can observe short lifetime chemical species during the reaction. That's the question uh, for Prof. Tang Lorat. And the last question uh, from uh, Pak Ahmad Bayu Aryawan from Faculty of Animal Husbandry, Halu Oleo University Kendari, Southeast Sulawesi. This is uh, the question is, where data science or big data science being affected by research methodology because many data will bring specifically detail for many parameters to find the strong result. Maybe, uh, Pa Ahmad, uh, I will give you an opportunity to maybe uh, ask directly to Prof. Stephen because uh, I'm not quite uh, get your question. Maybe uh, you can... Uh, I will give you an opportunity to ask directly after uh, Dr. Adi and Prof. Tang Lorat respond to uh, the question from the uh, participants. Okay. Please, Dr. Adi, you can give uh, the response from the question. Yeah, sort of, I, I, give, I will give like sort of a brief response to the question about how do you actually kind of understand the deficit model, but also how to implement the anti-deficit model in the, in the local context where you are uh, given the difference in sort of social cultural background. Um, did I capture that question accurately? Yes. So I think one of the things that is quite common in sort of math education is just that, like I said, um, is this tendency to when we're listening to students share their reasoning and mathematical thinking, uh, I think it's much easier for us to actually identify all the misconceptions and the errors that they're making. And a lot of the times what that ended up happening is actually we're not, um, and you know, this is fully recognizing that as teachers, as professors, we have a limited amount of time when we're engaging with students that often we, our focus is to address any kinds of issues that we see in their understanding. Um, but so the focus of the anti-deficit model is actually try to um, really listen the way that they are making sense of mathematics and the hope that um, the, in, in my work, it, it's about sort of extending mathematics beyond its sort of logical consequence. Um, there is, um, you know, uh, the field has been developed in such a way that it, it, it's axiomatic in a lot of ways. Um, but um, sort of uh, Elizabeth de Freitas and uh, Sinclair talk about this idea of concepts as generative devices. And what that means is basically this idea of the mathematicians practice in creating new things, new areas of mathematics, like such as complex numbers or even the notion of infinity and looking at the history behind that and thinking that um, the way that you go about doing that is you expand the current conception beyond the logical. Um, and so we do, we do not, um, and the reality is much of math education is, is that we're encouraging students to kind of um, continue to operate on the logical side of things and not necessarily giving them kind of opportunity to play around with mathematics much like the math students would. And, um, and so the, so for me, um, I think the whole point of this is to open up mathematics to folks, to people who otherwise have been disenfranchised in the past. And so I don't know, like I said, um, what, that, what that means from, from our conversations last night, sort of when I was kind of trying to understand the local context a little bit, it seems like the conversations around uh, about the participation of women in STEM or informational technology it's, it's one of the concerns that, that folks have. And so in thinking about that, a lot of the research um, that has come up is just this idea of like essentializing women in a way that they're less open, they're, you know, they're, they're less curious about certain things and, 
And they ended up relying on stereotypes and instead of actually thinking about the resources that, that students uh, sort of bring into these situations. So for me, um, implementing anti-deficit um, sort of perspectives in math education, it's really about understanding, recognizing the, the deficit narratives that exist about particular groups of students and then listening to their mathematical reasoning carefully, however imperfect they might be, to actually listen to the way that they actually make sense of the mathematics. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Adi. That's very nice uh, uh, response. And I wish we can collaborate as well uh, in mathematics education. Okay, next, Professor Tang Lora. All right, um, I will answer for the first question, first question about the interference factors. Uh, basically, we found that temperature has very minimum interference factor for the stand of Raman detection. Uh, humidity can can um, interfere a little bit as it has attenuation and maybe add some uh, water spectrum light into the results, but it's not that bad. So the most critical, uh, I can say the most critical interference is the the outside or the ambient light because our technique based on based on light detection and we. Uh, have very sensitive um, detecting uh, system. So mostly people try uh, want to work in the dark room right, for the very high sensitive detector, but we have the electronic circuit and algorithm to uh, make a fast shutter and we send the pulse to excite the materials. And we have the synchronization electronics to look at the Raman spectrum as a particular time, because we use the pulse um, narrow down to nanosecond time frame. So basically, we tell the camera or the detector to open just only that windows and close for all the time, so we can reject most of the ambient light. That that's the answer. So the conclusion is the other light is more more troublesome, not, not, uh, not, not quite the temperature and humidity. And the second question, is that possible to, to use the DY for medical application? Uh, yes, for Raman spectroscopy, people can use for uh, um, detect the cancer, but uh, you don't need very big system like this. This is for the standoff, this is for long distance. We, we, we use the smaller, and close range um, designs for Raman uh, spectroscopy system that can uh, detect the spectrum of, of cancer. But um, mostly the spectrum from biological material is quite complex because it's a mix of a lot of compounds. And right now it's, I think it's a, it's a good, good, um, uh, good data for for machine learning classification of that kind of complex system, people are, are doing that as well in, in the frontier research. They try to make a classification of very, um, very uh, mixed Raman signals and try to interpret for, for the cancer. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Tanongrat. Uh, with uh, Pak JP and uh, Buni Prasetya, we satisfied with uh, Prof. Tanongrat. Uh, response. And then uh, Prof. Stepan, do you get it with the uh, question from uh, Pak Ahmad Bayu Aryawan? So the question is, were data science or big data science being affected by research methodology? Because many data will bring specifically detail for many parameters to find the strong results. I mean, I, I can react on uh, on data science and, and big data science for, for research uh, and how it impacts the, the research methodology. Uh, so definitely there's a, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of uh, expectation uh, from scientists to get help from data science and in particular, uh, you know, the idea of big data. But actually for having worked in several projects with uh, in particular 
environmental scientists and chemists, uh, what you realize is that uh, big data in the sense uh, of uh, computer engineers doesn't really happens in science or it's not very common to have such big data uh, in the sense of data that you are measuring, you are getting from uh, sensors uh, or measuring devices. I mean, you all know uh, if you are doing some uh, physical science or chemical science or biology, uh, how expensive the, the, the sensors are. Uh, so very little chance that you're going to get uh, petabytes or even terabytes of data. Uh, to, to analyze that quickly. It may come, but uh, technology needs to evolve. However, um, data science and big data can be applied to the already available big data, which is, as I mentioned in my talk, the result of simulation. So I'm sure, again, many of you have been using simulators in uh, their own domain. And uh, once you have access to the simulator, of course, you need some computing power to create the simulation. But the simulator can uh, create lots and lots of data for lots of different scenarios that you may not even be able to easily observe in the real world uh, because they happen rarely, but you can easily simulate them. So the answer is yes. Uh, data science and big data will definitely impact uh, research, uh, but not necessarily by processing the big data that is coming from measurements that may come, but down the road when technology is sufficiently cheap so that we can take lots of measurements uh, for uh, not so much uh, money, uh, but definitely uh, will help analyze data coming from simulations. So I encourage uh, everybody to consider that looking at their simulator and trying to apply machine learning tools to see whether they can learn from the simulator more than they already put in. This would be my, my answer to uh, Ahmad. Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Stephen. Actually, uh, we still have one question from uh, for uh, Dr. Adi, uh, how can we focus on inference problems in student knowledge and intellectual ability? And what did you mean about attribute the problem to student on uh, shortcoming, maybe family or cultures? Yes, I'm, I'm actually sending sort of private messages to, to Anita uh, directly to answer the questions. But I think um, uh, my presentation is not uh, what I'm actually advocating in my presentation is to actually what to focus instead on what resources and um, ideas that students have that are actually productive in learning mathematics instead of just uh, focusing on uh, the shortcomings or even like things that they don't know how to do well. Um, so for me, it is about really taking the time to figure out how is it that they're making sense of it. Um, and oftentimes this is really challenging because and um, one one time uh, a mathematician kind of uh, talked uh, sort of talked to me in response to my to my presentation and said you know I've always thought that um, learning mathematics is kind of like learning a new language um, and he, and so that's a very common sort of description of learning mathematics is like learning a new language. But what he said was what I did not realize or what he hadn't realized at that time was how perfection is actually um, not productive in trying to learn a new language. So if you can imagine learning a new language, whether what, whatever language you want to learn, um, and to have a native speaker in the other room uh, constantly telling you that you're using the wrong word every time you try to speak and say something, that's not really helpful. Um, and so in, in some ways, that's often what, um, what many students um, experience in the classroom uh, with our focus in formal language um, is that they are trying to make sense of mathematics in imperfect language 
And oftentimes, um, and I have done this as well, that I get too uh, caught up in the, uh, their misuse of certain terms or certain language that I'm not actually listening to what they're saying. Um, so again, uh, what I'm advocating is for us to how do we recognize students' productive ideas in the face of imperfect articulation or explanation that they have? So, um, and as far as like attributing problems to students' shortcomings, um, this is kind of, you know, sort of uh, talking about stereotypes right? Like the reason, you know, oftentimes we rely on stereotypes for to explain why certain groups of students are not successful in mathematics or in science and in, in physics or any other engineering. Um, we rely on stereotypes to explain away the problem, not recognizing that the issue is not just the students or it's not about the students or the student's family or their background or their culture, but instead it is about them not having had the opportunities for schooling, not having had access to really good teachers who really think about the, day, the way that they think about things. And so that's what I'm, I'm thinking about in terms of uh, the alternate to attributing issues to students' own backgrounds is to actually examine the infrastructure, the way that the institution that we as teachers provide students opportunities to learn instead. Okay, thank you, Dr. Adi. Yeah, I think we have no time left for this Q&A. That's all our Q&A session. I do hope that we gain something fruitful from this plenary session. Thank you so much, Dr. Adi, Prof. Talongrat, and Prof. Stephen for your time. I do hope that this pandemic is gone and we can see you here in Universitas Negeri Semarang. Thank you also for all the participants for your attention. I'm Dr. Daniel Abidin. Remember to stay safe, stay healthy, and back to you, MC. Thank you so much. Thank you. All Thank the speakers. You. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are proceeding to the second plenary session from Associate Professor Dr. Roswanila Abdul Wahab from University Technology Malaysia, Malaysia, and Professor Dr. Amin Ratnoningsi from Universitas Negeri Semarang, Indonesia. And the session will be guided by Dr. Cepi Kurniawan. Before we start, let me present the profile of Dr. Cepi as the moderator. Dr. Cepi Kurniawan is the lecturer of Chemistry Department, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Universitas Negeri Semarang. Um, it is my honor to be here to be a chairman of the second plenary session. Uh, so previously we have uh, four gentlemen in science. Now I will be with two women in science. Um, the first speakers will be uh, Associate Professor Dr. Roswanira Abdul Wahab from uh, Universitas, uh, University Technology Malaysia. And secondly, we have uh, Prof. Professor Dr. Amin Retnoningsi. So first, I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Roswanira to talk uh, to the for the talk. Before the session, I would like to introduce you a uh, short uh, biography of uh, Professor Roswanira. Professor Roswanira uh, holds a bachelor degree from uh, University of Technology Malaysia, and also uh, her master degree from the same university, and. Uh, her PhD degree obtained from Chemistry Department, uh, University Putra Malaysia in 2012, uh, 2020. Okay, and then uh, current uh, research specialization of Dr. Roswanira is uh, in enzyme technology, uh, biomass based nanomaterials, green synthesis, and green chemistry approaches. And currently, his, uh, her, her works uh, in Enzyme modification, green synthesis, green biocatalyzed, uh, green fungicide, uh, as well as bioinformatics, nano emulsion, or very wide spectrum of research area. Uh, I know her very well. Uh, several times uh, I do some collaboration with her, and uh, I quite uh, surprised with uh, her achievement in the science. Now his uh, Scopus index is 19. So previously I met her, uh, his age index is about 9 to 10, but now it's now 19. 
uh, I congratulate to you, Professor. Okay. Uh, I would like to invite you for the first session uh, for the next 25 minutes. Uh, Professor Roswanira will give the talk. Uh, so you, the title is uh, Innovative Greener Hybrid Composites from Biomass through Prospectively Consolidated Multidisciplinary Research. Okay, the time is now yours. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chepi, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, let me share my screen first. And so, uh, okay. All right. Do you see it? Uh, not yet. Uh, still processing. Okay, now it's now yeah. showing. Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Dr. Chepi Kurniawan. So I think uh, we have been UTM, the Chemistry Department of UTM in Malaysia. We have been a long time friends for about like a few years now, right? Five years, four years, yeah? something like that. And um, I would like to thank the committee of uh, ICM, uh, ICMSE 2020 for uh, giving me the opportunity to share uh, my research and to give a talk uh, with regards to my research. So um, I'll, uh, I would like to introduce the things that we have done um, in the past few years with regards to uh, biomass uh, engineering, uh, deconstruction and biomass engineering. So now we are looking at uh, the world is going towards sustainability, yeah, greener processes and so on. And um, so what I'm highlighting today is uh, towards uh, that, uh, yeah, th that way. So let me introduce and yeah, show where UTM is. So UTM is in Malaysia, University Technology Malaysia, uh, Malaysia is in Malaysia. So we are between our neighbors is Thailand. Now, Thailand, neighbors is Thailand, and another neighbor is Singapore. So, we are sandwiched in between. And UTM is located in Johor Bahru, Johor Bahru here, and we are only 30 minutes, yeah, half an hour away from Singapore. And this is our lovely campus. So, this is the drone view of our lo uh, lovely campus. And... Um, if anyone who is ever interested to come and do your attachment here, you're very much welcome. So we welcome any postgraduates or any undergraduates who wish to uh, do internship or attachment in our university. So I would like to um, introduce my talk today so about the green hybrid composites yeah, from biomass. So if you're looking at composites, biopolymers, then we're looking at smart polymers here, yeah, uh, in which Biopolymers are those uh, which have undergone changes in dimension, okay, uh, physical properties because of a variety of stimuli that we have introduced. Or the definition is that uh, it contains uh, materials that contain actuating, sensing, and controlling capabilities built into their structure. Yeah, so we can build the capabilities into the existing structure by actually changing them. So these are a few of the capabilities that um, have been introduced or are, are already inherently within the uh, certain biopolymers that I'm showing here, in which uh, I will show further and focusing largely on the bio-based polymer, basically from the sugar-based one. So if you're looking at natural sugar-based polymers, uh, from agriculture and from uh, any sort of biomass, then we are looking at like the ones, yeah, sugar-based ones, those are the neutral polysaccharides, which is consists of cellulose, and we have the anionic ones, which is the negatively charged ones from the alginate, yeah, from the alginate, the seaweed, and we have the cationic ones from the marine organisms like mollusks, crabs, shrimp shells, their exoskeletons, and not forgetting from trees as well, the bark of trees, the woody part of the trees, which is high in lignin. And lignin has a lot of benzene rings, so we're gonna able to extract polyphenols for biofuel and further processing. And the only part of the uh, natural polymers will be that of uh, polypeptides, which is actually not sugar. 
So this one is mainly used for modification of food, yeah? food usually. So it's mainly for rheological modification. So you can see the samples yeah, of the biopolymers that we have in nature. And there are a lot of users on them. But aside from the sugar base, we also have natural inorganic polymers from nature, from the plant, such as plant silica. So a lot of them from biomass as well. And the well-researched one would be that from rice husk. Yeah, rice husk, especially from Southeast Asia. And it is uh, processed and converted into uh, nano silica powder or just silica powder. And the second one is carbon. Carbon, and I think a lot of us, yeah, those who are working, especially chemists, yeah, chemists and material scientists, uh, carbon is highly useful and they are activated and they are used for a variety of um, reactions such as bioconversions transformation, as well as uh, sometimes for hydrogen production, yeah, hydrogen fuel. And etching of carbon will result in production of uh, super capacitors for the semiconductor industry. So this can be obtained from biomass, any sort of biomass. Now, so today I would like to highlight something about the biomass, meaning that before we can actually, we can start using them, you need to deconstruct them and re-engineer the surface of the biomass. So, uh, and on my part, on our research group, we, are, we have been focusing on the oil palm leaves. Considering Malaysia is the second largest producer of uh, oil palm and behind Indonesia, yes. Indonesia has led for, I think, over a decade now, being the first, uh, biggest producer of oil palm. And we have harvested nanocellulose from the leaves, yeah, nanocellulose, and also silica. We have also harvested silica from the leaves itself to obtain the nanosilica. And our group, we have also worked with uh, chitin from marine uh, marine sources as well, but mainly from shrimp shells, shrimp exoskeleton. So the rice husk uh, has been worked extensively by another group in our department. So on my part, largely today, we'll be focusing on the nanocellulose mainly from the oil palm leaves because my lab happens to be, we have a large plantation background, yeah, uh, oil palm plantation behind our lab because UTM has its own oil palm plantation growing on it. So, so if you're talking about um, functional green biopolymer bio, bio composites, then you're looking at production from either top down, meaning that cutting up this bigger chunk of the trees and then separating out the little ones, eh? the little, little polymers and then cutting them down into smaller subunits. So this is what we call top down and it will produce the cellulose nanofibrils and also the cellulose nanocrystals. But there is another approach that we can use in which many, um, many biologists have uh, explored, which is the bottom up approach using bacteria to produce the nanocellulose. So basically linking together all the sugar subunits and making the nanocellulose polymer. So several bacteria are known and have been isolated and explored are the ones shown here. And this is the one is particularly from, um, very famous for agricultural studies as well for plant protection. But these bacteria also produce nanocellulose. So now the two types of cellulose here, uh, the CNC or CNF or the bacterial cellulose can be used for two, for two things, yeah? for two types of composites. One as gas nanomaterials, meaning that production of polymer composites marrying a host polymer with the nanomaterials obtained from the biomass. So what we get, we have functional nanocomposites yeah, for absorbent filter, biosensor, electrical materials, catalytic and fuel cell and so on. Or using the nanocellulose extracted as host polymer matrix. So this is to produce high quality polymer composites. So basically all of this, if you're looking at biomass and cellulose, then you're looking at cellulose, lignin, and also the hemicellulose. Now, looking at those components there, then we are looking at first to get the, then you have to deconstruct the biomass itself. 
So the process of deconstruction essentially is to change the physical outlook yeah, of the biomass that you start with, let's say, even soya bean plants or uh, cassava peels, any sort of peels as long as it's sugar-based. And we change the physical outlook by first cleaving the bonds. So we need to cleave the bonds to isolate, to remove the hemicellulose from the cellulose and to remove the lignin. Yeah, so only then we can isolate them. And by cleaving the bonds, we remove these impurities and we isolate them according to each individual components. And because of this, we've taken out the lignin and the cellulose, we have a more ordered region. So we remove the amorphous region, leaving behind only the highly ordered cellulose or cellulose nanocrystals or CNC. So when we treat them, so we will discuss later and I will show you later the kinds of treatments that we subject the biomass to. When we treat them, yeah, we remove all these impurities, the hemicellulose and lignin. Essentially, we are also punching pores. We are creating bigger pores in the cellulose for us to uh, do whatever reaction that we need to do after this. And because we create bigger pores, create more pores, we also increase the treatment, yeah, the deconstruction treatment also increases the surface area of the extract. Yeah? The cellulose, or the hemicellulose or lignin. We increase the surface area. In this case, particularly nanocellulose. Uh, yeah? We increase the surface area. So deconstruction is particularly for this, changing the physical outlook. Now, I would like to share the different kinds of dimensions of cellulosic materials from biomass. Yeah, because as I said, I'll be focusing mainly on cellulose. Yeah, because yeah, we've been working on it for the past um, uh, eight years. Yeah, eight years since I graduated my PhD. So we have the nanostructured materials, which is the microfibrils, the uh, and also microcrystals, and we have the nanofibers which is the CNC, cellulose nanocrystals, and also the cellulose nanofibrils. Now, these two, they're different. If you're looking at cellulose nanofibrils, then you're looking at a nanomaterial which is highly ordered. Highly ordered meaning that it is, has a high uh, degree of uh, highly ordered material, meaning that crystals, and it does not have any much, uh, very, very little of amorphous region. And if you're looking at CNF or cellulose nanofibrils, then we still have a mixture between crystalline and also amorphous, uh, amorphous region of the sugar polymer. And then the two also behaves differently, okay? So we will see that the nanofibers usually are used as the nanofillers, and this one will be the uh, form the advanced uh, general host polymer composites. This one, these two are usually used as nanofillers. So if you look at the dimension, one sugar molecule is one angstrom and cellulose molecule, which is the repetition of three molecules is one nanometer. So we know that uh, based on the size, we already know how many repeating units uh, that, uh, that comes, yeah? From the, from the size of cellulose that is measured through TAM, TAM analysis and so on. So now, done with the deconstruction. So we need to deconstruct, all done. So what we do now, we have to re-engineer the surface of all the materials that have been extracted and isolated from the biomass. Now, when you're talking about engineering, then you're looking at changing the surface outlook, changing the chemical composition on the surface of the nanofiber or cellulose microfibrils. So when we do that, when we do the surface modification, then what we are doing, we are introducing new functional groups, changing the groups, or introducing something, functional groups into something which is non-existent, no functional group on the top. But usually when it comes to cellulose, there is always functional group, which is the hydroxyl groups. Now, when you're doing this, we are looking at tunability. Yeah? Tunability of the uh, material, nanomaterials that we have extracted because it will be based on the, different, uh, on the different domains of application. 
that the fibers, the nanomaterials are intended for. So re-engineering is very, very important in the next step because it dictates how good the nanomaterial is for the intended uh, application. So if it's intended for, let's say, biocomposites for aerospace, greener composites, or lightweight uh, production of lightweight composites for aerospace use, then we are looking at something which is lighter. So incorporation of cellulose nano, uh, nanocrystals will be important. And how much to put in, how to incorporate will be something that is that the scientists will look at. Then we are looking at durability. Yeah, so we'll be looking at durability. But if the nanofibers, the nanomaterials are being used into a uh, biological system, for instance, for biomedical applications, drug delivery, tissue engineering, and so on, then we're looking at biocompatibility. Or we are sensing any sort of kit, yeah, kit development of kit for detection, let's say for COVID, SARS, and so on. Then we're looking for sensitivity. So we'll be because it is meant for biosensor. Okay, so compatibility is engineered into the surface modification. So if in terms of compatibility, these are some of the things, yeah, some of the uh, compounds, yeah? compounds that have been grafted onto the cellulose uh, fibers, nanofibers that have been used for such work. And if we talk about uh, pH and thermal responsiveness, then we're looking at hydrogel, aerogel, cellulose base. Uh, that has been incorporated into that. So this is for another different kind of applicability. Or if you're talking about generation of electricity, then we have metal ions such as uh, zinc or cadmium oxides, sorry, sulfides impregnated into the cellulose nanofibers for conductivity. So this one can be used also in the semiconducting, um, semiconducting industries. Yeah? you'll be surprised yeah, what can be done. And they can be re-engineered for photoluminescence for detection of cancer cells and so on. So what they add is coumarin and riboflavin. So it's uh, grafted on top of the, or the surface of the nanofibers. So their application is uh, wide ranging. So first, if you look at the construction, then we have to do pre-treatments. The kinds of pre-treatments that we're looking at will be that to essentially to remove the amorphous region. So we maximize the surface uh, surface area of the biomass, we remove the amorphous region so that it will help with further down downstream processing, which is the chemical modification and so on. So we're looking at chemical, physical, physiochemical and biological treatments. Chemical, of course, we have the greener method using the DAS, yeah, ionic liquids and so on, and then not so green method, which is our acid base and bleaching treatments. And we have the physical, we have those using high temperature and pressure, as well as um, electromagnetic wave and uh, different kinds of radiation or high energy molecules. And we have the combination of the two, which is this. And of course, now we are going more into the biological techniques, uh, especially where the world is going green in terms of processing. So we are using at the use of enzymes, basically enzymes from different microbes. So when you look at all these treatments here, chemical, physical, and biological, so these are the typical uh, agents that are used yeah, for the uh, deconstruction and re-engineering of the biomass, yeah, shown here. And I would like to uh, all of you to turn your attention to the biological treatments here. Yeah? Uh, currently, in fact, it's trending now. Uh, the scientific community is uh, turning towards uh, the use of enzymes to clean up, to do cleaning up, cleaning up the biomass, yeah, to get rid of all the impurities and so on using enzymes, lignanase, xylanase, as well as cellulase. Yeah, there are two types of cellulase. We have the cellulohydrolase, which is the AB. That is the uh, outer acting enzyme. And we have the enzyme endogluconase, which cuts from the inside of the sugar biopolymer. So now if you're looking at re-engineering, so we are looking at re-engineering the biomass into polymer composites as well as uh, composites, eh, nanocomposites, for all the, mainly these domains of application. So 
uh, these are largely the main domains of application that they are being re-engineered for. And when it comes to re-engineering of the biomass, then we are looking at the, in terms of Malaysia, so in the, from the Malaysian context, our mission to re-engineer the oil pump biomass is for production of bioproducts, bioenergy, and also for production of biojet fuel. So we are going along the lines there. So at least um, Petronas with the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, they have, um, they have a special installations being uh, set up at certain uh, parts of the countries uh, going towards this area here. But we, we, we do uh, acknowledge the challenges yeah, when it comes to biomass processing, meaning that to overcome the right recalcitrance, the stubbornness yeah, of the cell wall, yeah, we need to overcome it, we need to cut it up before we can extract the sugar or the phenolic intermediates for the fuel. And we have to reduce the oxygenated, uh, oxygenated intermediates to get the fuel molecules. So these are the challenges that we have. Along the bioproducts, yeah, if we do this, we get the bioproducts too. Because um, one thing about the processing, they are all integrated. Okay, when we're trying to produce all three, they are all integrated and we get all three. It's a matter in, in putting up the correct facility to carry out the, the works. Now, I would like to share with you some of the work that we've done in our group. So um, mainly we are only focusing on two, uh, mainly on this one. The second one is being, uh, being through my collaborator, which is a production of Sorbonne. So, so we produce specialized uh, supports for enzyme, yeah, enzyme supports, hybrid composites for production of uh, bioproducts meant for synthesis of biofuel. So we, fo our focus is on the oil palm leaves. So we focus on the leaves here, this kind of treatment, bleaching, alkali treatment to remove lignin and also hemicellulose. And finally, the acid hydrolysis because we were aiming for cellulose nanocrystals. Because acid hydrolysis, in the last part of the treatment, will give the nanocrystals, not the cellulose nanofibrils. So the extracted biomass is incorporated into various kinds of host polymers, major polymers, and then we carry out cross-linking between the little guys and with the larger guys, and we immobilize the lipases. Okay, so we got this. This is the immobilized enzymes. And when we are talking about the nanocellulose, for example, kytosan polymer that we used, eh, where we produced last time, then we are looking at biocompatibility. So when it, when it, when the polymers are meant to interact with proteins or bioactive compounds, bioactive compounds, then you have to think of introduction of amino groups and carboxylic groups, yeah, that 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 is able to covalently bind or form columbic interactions with the other bio compounds. And also we have to think of high loading of the enzymes or the proteins onto the surface of these um, composites so that they are able to carry out, in this case, synthetic reaction. So what we did was we synthesized this production. Uh, we, we focus on the production of an ester, which is butabuturate, uh, a very popular fuel additive in the South Americas. So what we did was we compared the enzymes, yeah, the immobilized ones and the free ones to produce this. And the immobilized enzyme within three hours managed to convert, produce, uh, convert 90% of the starting material into the uh, intended ester compared to the free one. So it's, it's a 30% improvement. And by, by immobilizing yeah, the lipases onto the, the, uh, the supports, We've also improved their thermal stability, meaning that the enzymes are able to catalyze the reaction a lot longer without dying no, or without denaturing. And they can be reused many times for consequence uh, for the subsequent reaction. And there is another one, as I said, uh, we had many composites. So another composite that we worked on was silica from the oil palm leaves. So the silica, uh, initially, we used to for the immobilization of lipase to produce fuel, yeah, biofuel. But uh, a collaborator of mine, so I gave this project to a collaborator of mine for the purification 
for treatment, eh? water treatment. Okay, so we we uh, coated the silica over magnetite. So we magnetize the nanoparticles for treatment. Okay, absorption of these uh, metal ions, unwanted metal ions in water, and also for the absorption of cationic dyes. So what we found that the, the composite that we developed from the biomass is six times more efficient than the SDA15 commercial solvent. So, but this is an ongoing project. So unfortunately, we cannot, uh, I cannot discuss further with regards to that. Um, but what I would like to highlight here is that um, uh, there is uh, actually potential uh, greener avenues eh, to, to deconstruct and re-engineer biomass. And the so way to go now, uh, we have about two minutes left. Okay. And um, this is through the use of ball milling and plus enzyme digestion to clean up the biomass. Okay. And having done so, we are able to remove the dialysis part in the, uh, this is, this is uh, the industrial way. We can remove the dialysis part because dialysis is expensive. Yeah. This is a greener way without the use of acids because acids and bases, it, it is a problem. Well, when it comes to the environment, because they have to be rid of. And there are a lot of uh, potential agro-industrial waste that can do this, that we can get the biomass. And not only that, the, so far, there are only 17 companies globally producing biomass. And considering there's a lot of research into bi uh, production of the nanocellulose, I think there should be more companies producing the nanocellulose, considering the, the trend of, uh, of it now. Yeah. So uh, I've already reach to the last part of my uh, talk. So if you would like to find out about the eco-friendly deconstruction of agro-industrial waste yeah, uh, to prepare renewable cellulose nanomaterials, so this is a review that uh, we recently published. So if you want to find out more, you can uh, download. So if you're interested to work on biomass. And uh, well, thank you very much. I've reached to the last part of my presentation. And I hope that for those who are interested to collaborate yeah, uh, for any whatever reason, yeah, from those from UNES or from other universities, please do contact me. And this is our research group. So there are many of us. So there are nine principal researchers all working together to, to achieve a greener future, a greener outcome of future. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Roswanira. Uh, very interesting talk. And... I think they're also uh, beneficial for all the particip uh, participants. Next, I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Amin Ratnanungsi. Ratnanungsi. Uh, before uh, uh, she delivered the talk, I would like to introduce you short biography of Professor Amin. Uh, Professor Amin Ratnanungsi was born in Banyumas, uh, Central Java, Indonesia. Uh, she obtained uh, his bachelor degree from Institute of Pertanian Bogor, IPB, and uh, master degree from uh, Universitas Gajah Mada. And uh, her doctoral degree, uh, hold, uh, he, he holds a doctoral degree from uh, IPB. Uh, now he also uh, appointed as a head of conservation development center uh, at Universitas Negeri Semarang. And uh, not only active in the uh, research and publication, but uh, uh, Professor Amin also create uh, innovative product from a community service called uh, Kriya Tulangdal. Uh, several publication also published in uh, Scopus Indexed uh, uh, website and also web, web of science. Uh, Prof Amin will deliver the talk about uh, Gum Pleasant, the best superior superior durian in Suruh Tembawang Village, Antikong Sanggau Regency, West Kalimantan. Okay, Prof. Amin, uh, you have about 25 minutes to deliver the talk. Time's yours. Thank you, Dr. Chaipi. Could you hear me? Yeah, I can hear okay. you well. Let me share screen. Okay. Okay, maybe you need to uh, slide show. Okay. Okay. 
Good morning ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I would like to share our journey to find uh, to find new best durian cultivar in Suruh Tembawang village. This uh, area is a uh, very near near be to uh, Sarawak, Sarawak, Malaysia. My team consists of uh, the chief of Yayasan Durian Nusantara, Muhammad Reza Tirtawinata, Tri Yanuar Yadi Prasetya, and Zulfikar. We did We made the journey to find new varieties of superior durian before the pandemic uh, COVID-19, uh, which is uh, early January 2020. Durian is fruit that is mostly liked by Asian of the 100 people survey 12% dislike durian 52% like durian and 28% like durian very much and the remaining 8% maniac durian and my team is uh, an example of the durian maniac Team, this like like this photo, the maniac group is durian lover who will hunt durian wherever the fruit is. They will always look for new superior durian varieties with unique taste or flavor. And why this uh, activity is important because the di discovery is new excellent durian will open up opportunities to improve the economy of the uh, people in the center of Jemplasem uh, Durian. Kalimantan uh, have 18 species of durian of 20 species of durian in Indonesia. Nine species are edible and 14 species are endemic to Kalimantan. One edible durian species is Durio zibetinus, found in almost all areas in Indonesia until Sabang, uh, from Sabang until Merauke. This durian is most preferred and Uh, very popular and so uh, had cultivated intensively. In Kalimantan, all species of durian, including the, the durian zibetinus, grow naturally in the forest. Antikong in Sanggo Regency, West Kalimantan, uh, uh, near uh, Malaysia, less than one hour, I think. Many superior durian I found in this area and uh, adjacent to Malaysia, consi consisting of five villages of Antikong. One of them is Suruh Tembawang. Uh, Pontianak distant to Suruh Tembawang is only uh, 157 uh, fifty kilometers, but it takes more than eight hours because uh, difficult to difficult to reach because reach there because the in I required road infrastructure. Uh, Alhamdulillah it is currently being built on Kalimantan Ring Road that pass through the, the village to the Suruh Tembawang village. Uh, we hope in this future, the, this village will be more open and accessible, uh, especially to developing uh, durian. 
Uh, there are three ways to find superior durian varieties. Number one, exploration in forest, field, or durian egg center. This is requires much time, effort, and money, and there are no guarantee that we can find new varieties. And then number two, durian breeding. Durian breeding takes a very long time and is expensive because it requires many parent plan of durian, of course, extensively experimental areas, and first to bear fruit, a, uh, four until five years. The results are not necessarily superior because the mating is random. And number, and number three, durian fruit contest at the production center. The work of the durian gem blossom in Kalimantan is guaranteed to be very abundant, considering that natural crossing is strike for, forward to occur. The most efficient and effective way to find new superior durian varieties is through durian contest in production center. Uh, one month before the competition took place, uh, we we have an informal uh, ensure to harvest time of durian and coordinate the contest time contest timing uh, for involving is many participants. Uh, the durian contest uh, during three days uh, from. Uh, during three days, each participant bring at least two durian. The criterion uh, and standard of assessment, most of aril characteristic. Why? Because the aril of the durian, uh, aril is the part of the fruit durian that is eaten. Assessment criteria uh, consists of taste, condition of the aerial fruit and seed, rain of fruit and aroma or odor. This is the uh, proportion of the criteria of the each criterion. Number one, aerial taste, thirty-five percent, consists of sweet, fat, bitter, and unique taste. Number two, condition of the aerial, uh, 30%. Thickness, color, moisture, moisture content, and soft texture. Number three, fruit and seed. Fruit sip, uh, linings, fullness, and seed size. Uh, then rain, and the last aroma. This is uh, the species that we can found in that in that location. Number first, first see Bli. Bli uh, has aril with turmeric yellow like this, and uh, thick almost two centimeter. Ariel with small seed and flavor like like ketan uh, and has brick value almost 35. It means sweet. And then number two, si kuning, Ariel uh, yellow fresh and uh, only one seed for its carpal. Rank cannot eat easy crack until seven days. And bricks value 37.6. And then number three, Sisibu. Sisibu has strong taste, orange yellow, bitter sweet, and brick value 36.4. And Sitik, Sitik. Uh, strong taste, yellow, brick value, uh, and aerial thick, not thick. 
uh, I think it it almost it is almost uh, two centimeters, maybe over. Number seven, eh, ma, uh, sorry, number five, si selaku, milky, thick, and has brick value 41.3. And this a uh, very sweet. We found the best 12 durian cultivar in Suruh Tembawang and number six until 11, until 12, si merah, si apek, si pongo, si bujul, si di, ferawati, and kindeng. Uh, there are no synonym uh, from 50, cool, 50 varietas uh, that we assess. There are no single varieties that has 100% characteristic like the other varieties. And each varieties come from seed germination, from uh, uh, fertilization by, by reproductive rep fertilization. Sibli at the best cultivar was visited to ascertain to position of the single mother tree, Pohon Induk Tunggal in Indonesia. The location of PIT Sibli is reached within three, 30, 30 minutes walk into the forest. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have successfully Sibli grafted until 1,000 plant seedling for developing superior durian field in the village in the Suruh Tembawang village. And uh, we hope Suruh Tembawang village which become a sustainable producer for the, uh, the best durian in the next five years. Conclusion, the best way to find new superior durian varieties is through holding a durian contest at the durian source location. And 12 new varieties of superior durian were discovered in Suruh Tembawang Village, West Kalimantan. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Amin. Um, very interesting talk about durian. So I hope the committee will also provide us durian from Prof. Amin. Uh, next, I would like to invite for the all speaker to be uh, on video mode. Uh, I'd like to read several questions uh, dedicated to the speaker. The first is uh, the question from Pak Sigit Priyatmoko from UNES. Uh, the question is for uh, Professor Roswanira. One of the weakness of natural materials is the presence of impurities, so that the uh, if we modify, uh, the the maximum result cannot be obtained. Uh, what effort can be made so that the result can be optimum as a pure substances? Maybe uh, I will also uh, connect to my question. Actually, uh, this is related to about uh, also durability, right? Uh, do you have any fact about? Uh, uh, which is better, uh, bio-based material compared to the synthetic materials? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So uh, this is, has always been the um, the issue highlighted about using natural materials yeah? uh, uh, in as components of uh, or production of greener composites and so on, or even adding them to the non-sustainably obtained composites. Now, uh, in other words, I think we have to dispel the notion that um, these nanomaterials uh, are weak. In actual fact, nan uh, natural materials, eh, nanomaterials or composites obtained from natural materials, if correctly processed, they are as good as, okay, as good as of the, these uh, synthetically produced ones or the ones that we obtain like in the case of uh, silica, right? Is silica if you obtain from bioness as compared to the pure, the, mm. the synthetic ones. With the case of nanomaterials from natural materials like nanocellulose, it is good. Right? It is actually good if we if it is subjected to the right order of process, 
-hmm. And then meaning that the impurities that we are looking at, depending on the intended application of the extracted uh, nanomaterial or uh, the natural fiber, depending on the intended application, then we are looking at the types of impurities that may impede its correct, uh, its, uh, its efficacy yeah, in terms of uh, use. Mm -hmm. So if you look at impurities in terms of nanocellulose, let's say for composites, especially like for the aerospace and so on, then we are looking at removal of lignin, we are looking mm -hmm. at removal of hemicellulose, yeah? and then we are possibly looking also at removal of silica. Because when you have impurities dotted within the, the main polymer structure, then we, we will have uh, we will have uh, weak spots because they are not of the same elegation at break strength because the strengths are variable. So these are the weak spots. So the only way to ensure that we do not have weak spots is to make sure that we remove nearly 100% of them, all those. So usually, currently, what method is being used, so we do... Uh, bleaching, we use alkali mm. treatment and acids. But I would recommend in order to produce uh, nanocellulose or highly purified cellulose composite with high crystallinity, mm. high crystallinity meaning that there is zero lignin, there is zero hemicellulose or silica in the nanofiber, the last treatment will have to be that of acid hydrolysis. That is currently the way that is being used. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. when those things are not there, the, the fiber itself will rearrange along the fibrillated uh, along along the way and it will be more crystalline. Because lignin and hemicellulose are the amorphous region. And being amorphous, they are loosely, you know, they are loosely, well, let's say arranged and they are prone to interact with other molecular systems. That is when the system, the composite becomes, it's not efficient okay. because of the impurities. These yeah. impurities are these loosely held sugar. They are loosely ordered. So the, my recommendation is that, is to do the acid treatment as the last part of the treatment to remove all the lignin and also hemicellulose, the final cleanup, mm -hmm. okay, the final cleanup. In terms of commercial uh, commercial processing, this is not a problem because when acids is used, they use, uh, of course, centrifugation and so on, but they use dialysis to remove the acid. But then again, dialysis is very important because it involves membrane and membrane technology is very is expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. So uh, in terms of that, as I said, for the, um, for the cellulose or the nanofibers to be adequately pure, Acid hydrolysis, the amount of acids to be used and how long is the treatment is very important to get rid of the impurities. Then if you have the cellulose nanocrystals, then the, 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 the working, yeah, the efficacy of its intended use yeah, for composites or for delivery of drugs and so on will be good because it has a uniform uh, chemical property, physical chemical properties, and it will act uniformly. I think that is the idea that everyone should understand. Okay. But the problem is um, acid is not recommended in the long mm -hmm. term. Uh, yeah. We have to move into enzymes, use of specific enzymes to do the cleaning up. Yeah, so but, maybe uh, uh, but there's something you can else. share uh, the highest uh, purity that you obtain from the uh, enzyme approaches of, uh, to, to, make, to obtain uh, nanocellulose, nanocellulose maybe or silica. Okay, so we are currently working on cellulose nanofibrils. If you're for cellulose nanocrystals, it's not, we are not there yet because we are trying to go green. So mm -hmm. our work now, we've embarked on mechanoenzymetic. So mm -hmm. marrying the physical, physical oh. treatment, so like uh, ball milling now and enzymes. So specific order of enzyme treatments is being used. But, uh, but that is for production of TNF, cellulose nanofibrils, not nanocrystals. Okay. Right. To get nanocrystals, the only way so far that has been uh, successfully uh, produced, yeah? successfully demonstrated, is to use the correct acid treatments, the correct combination of acids, as well as the correct duration of the acid treatment and the correct concentration of the acid treatment. So this all requires extensive statistical assisted optimization 
um, empirical work. It's, okay. it's quite hard. Yeah, it's quite hard. But but we are getting there. Like many okay. people are doing it. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, I will move first to uh, Prof. Amin. Uh, there's still a question for Prof. Ira, but uh, I will move to Prof. Amin first. So there are a question from uh, Fidia Fibriana. Uh, I would like to ask, can Indonesia has a special variety of durian, like Talian has Montong or Malaysia has Nusan King? So please, Prof. Amin. Ah, okay. Wait, Asia wait. the first, mm -hmm. especially in the world of the durian germ plasm and the ability of farmer and his budget. Mm. So for Indonesia, I think is it is more appropriate to develop durian according to the varieties in each region. Um. Maybe more precisely to develop durian destination. I think this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Uh, uh, I would like to for another question from uh, for Prof Amin uh, from Ibu Setior, Setiorini BPTP. Uh, are those durian that you present before uh, already registered to PPV PPVTPP Kementan or already released? PPVTPP or already released or local varieties? Thank you, Bu PPVT. This is durian. Uh, many durian cultivar have not registered through PPVP. Ah. Uh, it takes time and uh, budget, I think. And uh, uh, farmer uh, less interest for this in for this okay. PPVT and so on. Okay. Uh, until now, until now, I think. Okay, bro. Uh, I move again to Prof. Ira. There is a question from uh, Asih Gayatri. Uh, good morning. I would like to ask a question to Prof. Roswan Ira. How to know that the use of materials such as a cellulose is biocompatible for biomedical application, particularly in drug delivery system? So biocompatibility. Uh, biocompatibility for mm -hmm. biomedical application. Well, the first general rule in terms of biocompatibility, often we use something, yeah, the materials for the drug delivery system, yeah, and the vehicular system. If we obtain from something that is um, edible from plants and so on, it, it tends to be biocompatible. But biocompatibility can be engineered. It can be engineered into the biomass in the case of cellulose is already there. It has the hydroxyl groups. But it can be further engineered by adding uh, amino groups and also the uh, carboxyl groups because it will eventually form imine bonds. Eh? Mm. Imine bonds with whatever molecule that we're trying to attach to. So because biocompatibility, meaning that it is able to, to interact with whatever biological system we are trying to and put it into. Yeah, we are trying okay. to do that. And then when we're talking about that, then we're looking also at hydrophilicity, solubility of the nanomaterials and its interaction with the drug that we are trying to attach to. And with regards to drugs, it is we are trying to deliver the drug to the target system. Actually, it's by control release. Control release because interaction with nanomaterials is either through ionic and so on. It delays the release of the drug into the system. And biocompatibility, uh, CNC, cellulose nanocrystals, has been used with success for delivering um, drugs, yeah? and also with use with other prosthetic groups. It has been used with success. But one has to be careful with CNC. It has a certain degree of toxicity. So how much that you use is something that you need to look at. You still have to look at because it's crystalline. It's highly crystalline. So when it is crystalline, it's near to the to the physical characteristic of an inorganic system. Yeah. So so toxicity in terms of CNC is also being looked at, but at small doses it's not a problem. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. And maybe the last question uh, for Prof. Amin. Uh, maybe you can explain in Bahasa. Uh, there is a question from Ibu. Uh, Sorry, I forgot the name. Ibu 
oh, about I, I forgot. But I found that, that there is a question about what is aril. What is aril? Uh, aril? Aril is the part of the fruit durian. Dagingnya kah? Atau uh, no, no. The no. aril, arilus, uh, yang me, yang menutupi daging, yang menutupi biji. That is mm-hmm. aril. Oh. Hmm. Not not daging. Daging tidak okay. dimakan. Daging okay. itu kulit. Oke. Okay. Nah, And... aril is Eaten. Aril itu yang yang membungkus yang dimakan daging. oleh kita. Ah, oke, okay. ah. oke. Okay. And then the last question maybe uh, for this session from Pak Kumedi, uh, how to cultivate a good durian? Uh, not, uh, that doesn't change the quality over the time. Oh, oke. Okay. Uh, until now, ensuring stable quality durian fruit is still very difficult. Because it still depend only on nature. Fam- ah. Farmer don't do tree man- maintenance. No, only professional farmer can manage this quality. Mm-hmm. Most Indonesia durian farmer have not implemented proper and co- correct cultivation. Cultivation. Mm-hmm. So the result in the field are still unstable. That is. I see. Okay then. Thank only, you. Only only professional fa- farmer. Okay, thank you, Prof. Amin, uh, yes. for the question. Actually, there's still a lot of question in the chat room, but unfortunately, due to the time, I had to uh, finish this session. Uh, it is my honor to uh, chairman of your talks, Prof. Raswanira and Prof. Amin. I hope uh, you have a bright future uh, in the next uh, uh, time. Uh, good luck for your works, good luck for your research, and of course, uh, we are teachers. Uh, good luck to uh, spread the good, uh, to spread the knowledge of other words. Thank you very much. Uh, the time is over. I'd like to turn to MC Stephanie, please. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We want to thank to Rector, Dean, speakers for remarkable presentation, organizing committee, and especially all participants for the enthusiasm in contributing in our conference. We would like to inform all parallel speakers to join at each Zoom room as provided by the committee after the end of the plenary session. Don't forget to rename your display name based on your room. As all for participants, non-presenter, we would like to, to welcome you to any Zoom rooms that you are interested in and see in the list from the program book. And another information, we will be back after the short break. We will see you again at 12.25 p.m. for the parallel session. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of our plenary session. It's been our pleasure to host this event and I wish you all a pleasant day. I apologize if my if I might deliver an inappropriate speech and we will see you soon in parallel session. Thank you for your participation and let's give applause for all of us. Lima puluh lima tahun perjalanan Universitas Negeri Semarang menjadi pilar kemajuan pendidikan Indonesia. Lima puluh lima tahun mengantar talenta muda mengabdi di berbagai penjuru persada, menebar nilai konservasi, menginspirasi kemajuan negeri. Dilandasi niat mulia mencerdaskan bangsa, Universitas Negeri Semarang lahir tahun 1965. Ia bermetamorfosis menjadi rumah ilmu pengembang peradaban unggul menjadi kebanggaan Indonesia. Ia selaksa kereta, di mana Nia tulus menjadi rel, dan prestasi menjadi energi penggeraknya. Itulah yang mengantarkan UNES dewasa menemui jati dirinya siap menapaki hari baru sebagai universitas berkelas dunia. Secara kelembagaan, sejak tahun 2016, UNES telah dikukuhkan sebagai universitas unggul terakreditasi A. Ia juga menjadi rumah ilmu yang diminati anak-anak muda, menjadi peringkat lima perguruan tinggi paling diminati di Indonesia. Kualitas akademik mengundang pengakuan masyarakat dunia dalam 10 tahun terakhir. 
akselerasi jumlah prodi terakreditasi A mencapai 65 persen. Pada waktu yang sama, lembaga-lembaga dunia mengakui keunggulan melalui akreditasi dan sertifikasi internasional yang diperolehnya. Hasilnya, Universitas Negeri Semarang menjadi ruang nyaman bagi lahirnya cendekia muda berkelas dunia. Prestasi mahasiswa bertebaran dalam bidang akademik, inovasi, kewirausahaan, seni, dan olahraga. Laksana pohon yang terus bertumbuh, semakin rindang, semakin indah, semakin besar kebermanfaatannya. UNES unggul untuk Indonesia maju.